Good morning to everybody. You alive? I like it. Like three of you. I saw a water bottle uh, this morning, um, and I needed the reminder of what we've kind of been looking at this semester. It was a little round sticker, and it said, in view of God's mercies, and I needed to see that today as much as anybody. Will you please live as people who are receiving grace and mercy and hope and transformation from a God that wants to do something big in you? Romans 12, remember, it's important for us. Even in the middle of the semester, have some hope in view of God's mercies. This morning, I'm excited to introduce our speaker as a key part of some of our core values in chapel. Uh, the executive chapel committee team look at the calendar and really intentionally try to make sure that we, uh, on a rhythm, have some of our local pastors from the community around APU. Uh, the church that today will really be highlighted and the pastor will be highlighted is a historical church in this area. Uh, a lot of you probably laugh if you're from the East Coast at 135 years, but in Southern California, that is historic. There is a church by the name of Purpose Church that has quite a few different pastors, thriving ministries that really in some ways today we're excited to highlight. One of their executive pastors, one that's helped set really mission and vision for the team, Pastor Lisa Tony will be speaking to us today. She is a Fuller uh, Theological Seminary grad with an MDiv, as well as a real vibrant mom that has three kids that keep her and her husband very busy. She's an author, book called Thrive, Live Like You Matter. And really today, will you do something for a local pastor because they serve and they do so much different things that sometimes I hope they come to APU and they're encouraged as well. Will you give Pastor Lisa Tony a big welcome from APU as she comes and brings God's word for us. Welcome, Pastor Lisa. Well, it was a few years ago, it was Thanksgiving weekend, and uh, it was actually Thanksgiving Day, and my husband and I were catching a flight to go visit relatives for Thanksgiving dinner. We had only one daughter at the time, she was a toddler, and uh, we got to the airport on Thanksgiving Day to travel, and the flight was delayed. Not a good start. We got on the flight, and then um, my daughter threw up all over the plane, all over her car seat, all over us. Luckily, it was not a long flight. So we landed. We had to catch a rental car. So we put the thrown up car seat in the rental car, headed to Thanksgiving dinner, and realized we probably shouldn't show up this way. So we stopped and um, grabbed some showers. And while I was in the shower, I had put my jewelry on the counter. And when I got out of the shower, my toddler had found my wedding ring and hidden it in the house. I had no idea where it was. So we said, well, we'll find it later. And we ran off to Thanksgiving dinner and we pulled up and we got in and we opened the door to say hello. And they had just finished Thanksgiving dinner. Don't you hate it when you're late? Have you ever been late for something? And you're like, man, I hate when I'm late. Now, some of you don't hate being late. I know we've got different people in the house, right? Some of you always show up early, right? Who's my early people? Who loves to show up early? Okay. How about those people who are right on time? Like always right on time. I roll in right when we're starting, baby. Okay. And then some of you, you just, you know, like to wander in maybe a few minutes late. Who's my late people? <laughs> All right. Yep. I know. It. Okay. Well, I found some really good excuses for being late. So um, you probably should not try these on your professors. But, you know, they're just kind of fun to pocket just in case you ever need one. Um, one employee called into her place of work and said, I'm late. I accidentally put glue in my eye instead of my contact lens solution. Right? Yeah. This one's pretty good. Hey, the line at Starbucks was out the door. And I just can't start my day without coffee, right? Priorities here. Um, this one was good. Someone robbed the gas station and there was no gas and I didn't have enough gas to make it to the next gas station. Um, or this one's pretty good. My left turn signal was out and so I had to make all right hand turns to get to work, right? <laughs> well, how about God showing up late? Have you ever wondered, why is God late to this party? Where is God showing up when I need him? Have you ever had to wait upon God? Have you ever asked the question, why doesn't God do something about that? What is your that today? Maybe you're sitting next to your that. Maybe your that is back at home. Maybe your that is in class. 
Maybe your that is something that is going on in our world today. Have you ever wondered why doesn't God show up for that? You know, and preachers, we make it seem so simple. I mean, sometimes we're not any help at all because we say things like, you need to pray harder, you need to have more faith, you need to get rid of sin, and we make it seem like it's your fault that God is not showing up. And other people make it hard, too, don't they? Sometimes it's the other people, and they seem like they get everything that they need. They've got the money, they've got a normal family, they've got, the, they got into the program they wanted. I mean, things just seem to go so easy for them. And sometimes our Christian friends aren't any better, right? Sometimes our Christian friends are like, oh, well, I was driving and I was running late and I went to the mall and I just needed a parking spot. And so I just pulled up and right in front of the store there was a parking spot and God answered my prayer. And you're like, what? What is this? I am praying about something really big, something like a relationship, something like a financial situation, something like a future job, and God answers a petty prayer request like a parking spot? How does that work? It just doesn't make sense. Maybe sometimes you even begin to wonder if you still believe. Does God really hear Is there even a God out there that is listening to our prayers? What do we do when God is silent? When God seems to not speak and you don't even know if he hears you or if he cares about you. Sometimes, despite our most fervent prayers, God doesn't show up in the way that we want him to. The cancer isn't cured, we don't get the job that we want, or that person becomes president of our country. Sometimes those that's happen and we wonder where God is. So today we're gonna be in John 11. I love chapter 11 in the book of John. Um, This story, it helps me so much as I wrestle through some of these questions. It's about real people who experience some of these questions, some of this wrestling with God. And it's about people who knew God, people who were followers of Jesus, people who loved Jesus, people who knew Jesus, and Jesus showed up late for them. Now, there's no simple answers in this story, but it does give us a confidence that God is still with me, even when I cannot see him. And it helps us to know that we do not need to associate the difficulties of life with the character of God. So this story is going to put a smack dab in the middle of some of these questions, and it gives us a glimpse of how God works, how God responds, and how God hears, even when we feel distant from God. All right, here we go. John chapter 11. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and Martha, and her sister Martha. Now this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with our hair. So our writer, John, here is going to clue in the people of the first century which Mary it is, because Mary was a pretty common name in the first century, so we know which Mary it was. Verse 3, so the sisters sent word to Jesus. So Jesus was not there. He was in a neighboring village. We figure it was about a day and a half walking distance from where they were. And the text goes on to say, this is the message they sent, Lord, the one you love is sick. So the writer, John, of this account had already told us that it was Lazarus' name, but in the message that Mary and Martha sent to Jesus, they didn't mention his name. They just said, the one Jesus loves. I mean, how'd you like that to be your hashtag, right? The one Jesus loves. I mean, that's how he was known because he was such a dear friend of Jesus. Verse 4, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. So Jesus begins to do something interesting in this teaching. He begins to create a new category, this particular sickness. It says, no, it, this sickness, it's for God's glory. So why is Lazarus sick? I mean, sickness is a bad thing, right? I mean, nobody wants to be sick. And Jesus is doing something interesting here in his teaching as he begins to talk about this particular sickness being used for his glory. 
And the text goes on to say, so that God's Son may be glorified through it, so that you can see the glory of God. Now, this is a new way of thinking. As Jesus begins to to talk through the events of this day, he is starting to help people start to see that there can be hope and even a hopeless situation. And John, who's writing this, is going to give us some commentary to help us stay with the story because what's going to happen next is so unbelievable, you're not even going to believe what happens. And so he's going to kind of help us to kind of get some buy-in here to what's going on because what is going to happen, we're going to think that Jesus did not love Lazarus, that he did not care at all about Mary and Martha. But in verse 5, John eleven five, 5, the text says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Jesus loved these people. Okay, you got that? You got to hang on to that because this story, you're not going to believe that that's true. So when they heard that Lazarus was sick, okay, so the they is Jesus is hanging with the disciples. And everybody knows that Jesus was dear friends with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They used to stay at his house. They'd have dinner with him. These were his friends. And so I can only imagine that when the disciples heard that Lazarus is sick, they're like, all right, let's pack it up. We're out of here. We got to go help Lazarus, Jesus' friend. And Jesus says, no, guys, sit down. Sit down. We're not going anywhere. And the text says this, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? So I'm thinking they're thinking, "Um, Jesus, you may not remember this, but back in Judea, they tried to stone you. And here's the implication. Sometimes, Jesus, when they try and stone you, they miss and they hit us. We don't think we ought to head back to Judea. Um, They're trying to protect Jesus there, but I think they may have really been trying to protect themselves a little bit. And Jesus does something really weird here. John tells us that Jesus responded to them in this way. He says this. Jesus answered, verse 9, Are there not 12 hours of daylight? Well, yeah, Jesus. What are you talking about? How does that help us in this situation? I can only imagine John is like, shh, let's just write it down. We'll figure out what it means later. Just go, just go with it, people. Go with it. So Jesus goes on to say this really weird thing. Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. This is so profound. What is he talking about? What is Jesus doing here in this moment when he's trying to get them to go to Judea? Well, Jesus, as he's talking with the disciples, he's talking about opportunity. He says, when you, when the sun goes up, you have an opportunity. There is only only so many hours of light in a day. It is when you have that light that you can get things done and you can be productive. But when the sun goes down, you lose your opportunity. And he says, hey, guys, listen, I am here to be the light. You have opportunity when you are with me. And eventually when I leave this earth, the light is going out and you will be left in darkness. But if you go with me into Judea, if you go with me to Bethany, I am going to reveal something to you that's going to be like a candle, a light in the darkness that you can hold on to throughout the rest of your life through the darkest times. You can stay if you want. Stay safe. You don't have to go. But you just might miss the opportunity of a lifetime. But if you get up and follow me, I'll show you the light. So come on, let's go. All right, the text goes on to say this, verse 11. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. And his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So, you know, his disciples are not so excited about going. Stoning does not look good to them, so they start giving Jesus medical advice, right? Jesus, if he's asleep, dude, he's going to wake up. Things are going to be fine. We don't need to worry about him. It's all right. His fever will will break. We're all good. Let's just stay here. Um, And Jesus goes on and tells them very plainly. Scripture even says he says it plainly. Verse 14. So then Jesus, he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And then perhaps one of the most insensitive statements we hear Jesus ever say in Scripture follows. It's, It's hard to believe that 
Jesus would even say this, and he says this to his closest followers. Verse 15, he says, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there. I am glad I was not there. Wait a minute, Jesus, you knew your dear friend was going to die, and you didn't go on purpose? Mary and Martha asked you to come, your dear friends, and you could have helped, you could have done something, and you didn't go? What are you talking about? What could be so important that you would let the one that you love die? And scripture says this, so that you may believe. Let us go to him. So we've got a purpose statement written in scripture, so that you might believe. It is that important for, uh, for you, for us to have faith in you? And Jesus says, yeah, it is that important that this whole scenario playing is out is for this single purpose, so that you would have faith and that you would believe. Scripture goes on to say, verse 16, and then Thomas, also known as Didymus, so Thomas is the disciple that kind of gets a bad rap for, you know, being the doubting disciple. So do you guys remember Winnie the Pooh when you were a kid? And Eeyore was always like, ah, ah, he was always the one complaining, right? I mean, there's always one in a group. Like if you've got more than three kids in your family, one of the kids in your family is the Eeyore, right? Um, maybe you've got an Eeyore, your, your uncle or your grandpa or your dad, someone. We all know an Eeyore, right? So, so doubting Thomas is the Eeyore of the, the disciples. And so he says this to the rest of the disciples. Let us all go that we may die with him. Lazarus is dead. Jesus is going to get stoned. We're all going to die with him. It's going to be one massive funeral. Let's go, Jesus. So um, they all start heading out. And on verse 17, it says, On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Okay, so here's like high drama moment in scripture. Um, Back when Lazarus was dying, I mean, there was no drugs, no morphine, nothing for pain during that time. And Mary and Martha, his dear sisters, had been lying over him, wiping his brow, taking care of him, um, trying to get him to drink some water. And I can only imagine they kept reassuring him. Lazarus, hang on. We've told Jesus that you need him. Jesus is on his way. Jesus is coming. Hang in there, Lazarus. Hang in there. And the whole community waited and watched and no Jesus. Jesus didn't show up. Lazarus died and still no Jesus. I can only imagine they must have been in shock, been in disbelief, been in maybe some anger. Maybe they still hoped that Jesus would show up. And I can only imagine the community gathered around Mary and Martha and said, Mary, Martha, we have got to bury Lazarus. He, Jesus is not coming. So they wrapped him in the grave cloths and they put him in the tomb and they sealed the door shut and they began to mourn. Isn't that where we live sometimes? I thought you cared about me, God. Why haven't you showed up for my that? Where are you? I've called out to you. I've invited you into this situation. And God reassures us through the story that he cares about the that. And he created this moment in time to respond to us when we are in that place. Now the story goes on to say, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now four days was significant in the ancient world because they were superstitious and they believed that the spirit actually hovered over your body for three days. And then when your face began to decay and change, that's when the spirit left the body. And so Jesus showed up after four days. And so to all the ancients, they knew that there was really, truly no hope because Lazarus was dead. He was four days dead. He was double dead. He was really dead. There was no hope. Can you imagine how embarrassed the disciples must have been to follow Jesus into Bethany at this moment? I mean, he didn't show up when they needed him. He didn't even come to the funeral. And he has the nerve to set foot in this little town of Bethany after they are in full mourning. Scripture says, now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. 
So many people were there as Mary and Martha grieved. And scripture goes on to say, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Why do you think Mary stayed at home? Come on now, people. She was mad at Jesus, right? She was mad he didn't show up. She was mad he didn't show up to heal him, to save him. She loved Jesus and she trusted him and he let her down. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So Martha interacts with Jesus and she's like, Jesus, this is your fault. If you would have showed up, this whole situation would look differently. But she goes on to say, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know. I can envision, she kind of is like, I know, I know. This is the place where people try and comfort you. Um, he's in a better place. And maybe Martha thinks that Jesus is going to get a little theological on her. Um, sh she goes on to say, he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Don't give me a theology lesson, Jesus. I know that he will be resurrected on the last day. I know we will all be in heaven, but you should have been here. And Jesus looks at her and says something that maybe only a crazy person or someone who's completely wild and outrageous would say. Or perhaps only the very son of the almighty God. He looks at this angry and confused woman and he says to her what he says to you and I today. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Martha, you think resurrection is about an event and it is. You think it is about the future, and it is, but I am resurrection and life. Would you say that to a woman who just lost her brother? And he goes on to say, the one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he asks a question, and Jesus asked this question, and I believe he asks it to you and to I today. And this question has a different answer depending on where we are in our life. It might have a different answer when we are 5, or when we are 15, or when we're 25, or when we're 45. He asks this question, and in the midst of her hurt and her pain and her tragedy, he says this, do you believe this? Do you believe it? Mary, you have just experienced a horrific event, and after all that you have experienced, do you still believe? Do, I, do you believe that I am who I say I am, even though I may not act the way you think that I should act? I mean, this is amazing that God would set up this whole story for this one particular question. And she goes on to say what she believes. She says, yes, Lord, she replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. And then she runs back and gets Mary. And Mary, come on, get out here. And they kind of go through a very similar thing. So we'll jump down to verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she reached at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus records something here that's helpful when you are going through a really difficult time in your life. It shows us that God has the ability to enter directly into our pain, that God is never too big, God is never too busy, God is never too distracted to lean into your pain. God always can lean in and says, I know. And the verse in verse 35 is Jesus wept. Jesus wept for their loss and their hurt and their pain. And the text goes on to say, and then the Jews said, see how he, he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind men have kept this man from dying? Why didn't he do something about that? The text goes on, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And then he said something. That was completely unexpected. Lazarus had been in the grave for four days, double dead, really dead, four days dead. And he said, take away the stone. What? Move the stone away from Lazarus' tomb? What is the rock in your life that feels impossible for God to move right now? Where has God showed up late in your life? What is your protest? Because Martha has one. 
Scripture says, but Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. And I think Mary's kind of twisting the knife here. Four days, Jesus. Four days we waited for you, and he's dead. And Jesus says to her, this is so good, Jesus says to Martha, and I believe he also says this to you and I, Jesus said to her in verse 40, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? What? This is what this whole thing is for, Jesus? This whole thing is so that we can see the glory of God? Jesus says, yeah, if you continue to keep your eyes on me, if you continue to have faith in me, if you continue to put your trust in me, God is going to show up, and you might just catch a glimpse of my glory. So verse 41, they took away the stone. And I love this part because Jesus is not smack, he goes smack dab into the middle of that death. He's not afraid of it. He's not afraid of a really stinky situation. And now Jesus is going to pray here. And before Jesus gets ready to pray, I just want to let you know what he's doing. Because he kind of has this little sideline with God and says, God, hey, you and I know what's about to happen here, but all these people don't know what's going to happen. And so I want them to see me talking to you so that they know when this thing happens that I am reflecting you. This isn't just a me thing. I am reflecting your glory, God. And I'm going to reflect it in a big way. You ready? Here we go. So, Scripture goes on to say, Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And then the dead man came out, and his hands and his feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And they watched something that they could not believe. They watched a dead man, a stinky, double-dead, four-day dead man, wrapped in grave cloths, come to life. And it wasn't the zombie apocalypse, and it wasn't a scary movie. It was real before their eyes. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Do you know why Jesus had to say this? Because I think everybody was standing there with their mouths hanging open and no one was making a move towards Lazarus. They're like, uh-uh, I'm not going over there. And Jesus is like, go, go to him. Okay, and then this is maybe one of the biggest understatements in scripture. I love this. Verse 45, therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. I bet they did. They just saw a dead man come to life. Everyone in the whole area probably put their faith in him. Jesus brought a dead guy back to life. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that Jesus cannot do. So here is the question. If he can do that, why doesn't he do something about your that? But here is what I know. Because of that day in Bethany, he can. Sometimes he waits, but I can trust him in the meantime. And he made us this promise, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. And in only a very short time, was God was going to ask the people that loved Jesus to go through this again as Jesus was buried and the tomb was rolled over his grave and the followers of Jesus probably asked, why doesn't God do something about that? He can. Sometimes he waits and we can trust him in the meantime for his glory. And God showed up late at Jesus' crucifixion too. But he moved that rock in front of Jesus' tomb. That stone was rolled away because it could not contain the glory and the power and the authority of the almighty God, Jesus the risen one. And we can go through life sometimes and feel very distant from God, but still maintain our faith. God is never late. God is never inattentive. So world changers of APU, I want you to thrive. And this is the secret to thriving. If you hit a stumbling block, wait for God to move the rock. If you hit a stumbling block, wait for God to move the rock. 
sometimes we have to wait and we can trust him in the meantime. It was the message for the disciples at the crucifixion and it has been the hope of the church ever since and it is the message for us today. If you wait and trust, you might, you may, you probably will catch a glimpse of the glory of God. Amen. Thanks for being here today, you guys. Have a great day.